everyone, and welcome back to another episode of What the Forensics. My name is Nicole, and as always, I am joined here again by the lovely Journey and Rebecca. Um, for this episode, Journey will be telling us a little bit about the case of Victoria Klimby, and then Rebecca, following that, will educate us on the science of forensic parasitology, and then we're going to have a bit of a small discussion about kind of how these two intersect. I would like to note that there is a listener's discretion advised as there are detailed descriptions of child abuse and neglect. Um, On that note, Journey, would you like to delve into this case of Victoria Klimby and kind of give us an overview and context of this case study? Yeah, for sure. Um, Yeah, like Nicole said, there is child abuse and neglect. So if that's something that is um, especially hard for you to listen to, I would suggest skipping the first portion of this episode. Um, But yeah, so Victoria Klimby was born on November 12th, 1991 in the small village of Abowo, which is near the city of Abidjan, the former capital of the Ivory Coast. She was the fifth of seven children born to Francis Klimby and I think Bertie Amoisi. Um, that's my best guess. Apologies if I have that wrong. Um, Victoria was fluent in both English and French and was the entertainer of her family. Because her country is in the midst of civil wars, has insanely high poverty levels as well as illiteracy levels among women, her parents were approached to her great aunt to go live with her in France just before Victoria's seventh birthday. Her aunt, Marie-Therese Quao, was visiting for her brother's funeral when she visited the Klimby family to kind of make this offer. Um, and the brother in question is not Victoria's dad. It's someone else. They didn't actually explain how she's considered her aunt. So I don't know if it's just... Um, Because some cultures just consider any older person their aunt and uncle. So I don't know if that's just where that name came from or not. Um, However, unbeknownst to Victoria's parents, Marie Therese was only offered to have Victoria stay with her to access better state benefits and child welfare. Um, She had already tried to get another child named Anna from another family. And so she had created a fake passport in Anna's name, but Anna's parents refused to let her go live with her. And so Marie Therese decided that it would be easier to try and recruit another kid than to change the name on the passport or to change any information on the passport. So she then targeted Victoria and gave her hair extensions so that she would match the passport photo. And so Victoria then became known as Anna throughout her time in the United Kingdom and in France. Um, But I'm just going to refer to her as Victoria so we don't get confused. And so... Marie Therese took Victoria to Paris, where she began to get child benefits from her because she claimed Victoria as her daughter, Anna. And so Marie Therese was required to send her daughter to school, but she only allowed Victoria to go to school part time. And so around December of 1998, Marie Therese was receiving warnings from the school about Victoria missing so much of it. And then by February 1999, a social worker was actually involved And then Victoria's last day at this school was March 25th, 1999. And it's reported that she had a shaved head and was wearing a wig during this day. And shortly after that, they left for the UK. And in April 1999, they arrived in Ealing, West London. And between April 26th and July 7th, Marie-Therese visited 14 different social workers attempting to secure housing support. Uh, Victoria was with her for half of those visits, but she doesn't speak English and she looked very disheveled. Um, I realize now that she was not fluent in English and French at this point because for the rest of it, they're like, oh, she didn't speak English, so she didn't understand what was happening. So I must have got my information mixed up there. Could it have Um, been something where like the aunt was telling her not to speak English or like telling her to kind of go along with it and act a certain way to hopefully get more help yeah that's kind of why they thought yeah they explained away like her appearance because she looked so like disheveled and just like out of it they kind of were like oh she's just trying to make them look worse off than they actually are so that they can get more like sympathy and money kind of Mm -hmm. thing um but i don't know exactly yeah what happened yeah And so then in June of that same year, one of Marie-Therese's distant relatives, Esther, 
calls uh, Brent social workers. And so Brent is the little like community that they're living in in London um, to say that she thinks Victoria is being abused. And so Esther had seen Victoria not long after they had arrived uh, from France. And then when she saw her a little while later, she noticed a new scar as well as some other new injuries. And so Marie Therese explained that Victoria had fallen on an escalator, but Esther didn't quite believe her. And Esther also began noticing blisters around Victoria's hairline uh, where she was wearing a wig, but was told that she just had an incident with hot water and not to think anything of it. And so Esther then made a surprise visit to their house and noticed how much weight Victoria had lost and the living conditions that they were in. And so she made another call to the Brent social workers to check on their progress, but nothing is done um, due to a giant like miscommunication within that social working office. And the social worker who received the call said that it was concerning a child who was not going to school, not about a child who was being abused like for the first phone call, I guess, but who knows. And then in early July, Marie Therese moved in with her boyfriend, Carl Manning, in Tottenham, North London. Carl was a bus driver in his late 20s, and Marie Therese was in her early 40s at this time. And they actually met on his bus. And so then not long after Marie Therese and Carl Manning had moved in together, two social workers visited um, the old address, but no one answered the door and no further attempts were made to contact the previous tenants to expand on the referral that got them sent there in the first place, which is really annoying because they went there on a child abuse case and no one answered the door and they just left it. And so Marie Therese was working at the hospital now, and so she left Victoria with a childminder and the children of the childminder, um, who she met through the hospital as well. And after they had moved in with Carl Manning, he didn't want Victoria, so Marie Therese asked if the childminder could look after Victoria permanently. Um, She said no, but agreed to take her for the night. And it was during this night that they noticed the extent of Victoria's injuries and they took her to the hospital the next day. And so Victoria was examined for two hours at the start of this hospital stay. The doctor noticed that there were cigarette burns on her thigh and everyone who looked at her thought that the injuries didn't look accidental or self-inflicted. However, the next morning, a senior consultant diagnosed them as scabies. And so scabies is an infectious disease that causes rashes on the skin And so it's accepted that Victoria has been scratching herself because of scabies and that her injuries are self-inflicted. The consultant pediatrician person didn't actually talk to Victoria about her injuries at all and just took the word of Marie Therese. I don't even know if she actually saw Victoria. Victoria was then sent home with Marie Therese after the police officer in charge of her case learned that she had been diagnosed with scabies. And so under the Children Act in 1989, which was in place at the time, the police officer was required to tell Victoria that she was under police protection during her time in the hospital, but she did not, nor did she talk to Marie Therese and Carl. And ironically, the police officer in charge of the case was attending a seminar on child protection when she allowed Victoria to go home to her abusive family. Ten days later, on July 24th, 1999, Victoria was readmitted into the hospital. Well, this time, she was suffering from burns to her head and face. Marie Therese said that Victoria had tried to get rid of her scabies and the itching by pouring boiling water all over her head. This hospital visit is kind of unique because there's actually, like, photos of Victoria, um, like, taken during her examination. Um, But in all of these photos, Victoria is still smiling and all of the nurses kind of remember her as dancing around the hallways in the hospital in the pink rubber boots that they had given her by the nurses just to kind of like make her stay a little bit better. However, there was a noticeable change as soon as Marie Therese entered any room. Um, The witnesses said that they, they being um, Victoria and Mary Therese, acted more like servant and master than mother and daughter. And so other nurses noticed that there was a belt buckle imprint on her body. Uh, Victoria is so afraid of her aunt that she actually wets herself during one of her interactions. And so during this interaction, Marie Therese was like yelling at Victoria, like telling her off. And so Victoria immediately like jumped out of bed and like kind of stood at attention and then proceeded to like wet herself, which is heartbreaking. Would that not like 
give evidence to those examining her about situations that could be happening at home. Because I understand, yeah. like, she's been examined in the past and they came to the conclusion before that other doctor, whoever came in, that this doesn't seem normal. This is not self, self-inflicted. But obviously, when you have the higher power, whoever, doctors say, no, it's just scabies. You have to listen to that. But, like, it gives you a little more context to the case. Would you not then think, mm, something does not right here? Yeah. And so even with this hospital visit, like all the doctors and nurses were like, okay, there's abuse happening at home. Like this poor little girl is yeah. being abused. But they thought the police and the social workers were aware of it and kind of knew of it. Oh. So they didn't say anything or do anything. Wouldn't. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Like I can understand that, but wouldn't it be your duty to just let them know in right. like regardless if you think they know or not just to kind of reinforce yeah. that be like hey this is going on we need to report this you may already well, know but it still needs to be reported that's that what feels I like it would have been like the ethically and morally responsible thing to do mm-hmm. yeah and I feel like unless there's a police officer there telling you, like, we know this little girl is being abused, we're doing what we can, you yeah. is, you can't assume yeah. like, that they know it, right? Especially with something like child abuse and neglect. Like, I feel like more should be done rather than the assumption aspect, you know? Exactly. And even, like, because Victoria was at the hospital for 10 days, like – um, like during this visit to like allow mm-hmm. the burns to heal and no one asked her what had happened they what? only yeah they only asked like marie therese marie therese was just like oh like she poured boiling water on her head to stop the itching no one actually asked victoria like did you actually do that like what actually happened could that have been a language barrier thing like was this coming back to the whole she may not have spoken english or she that kind it's of possible thing? yeah like you but then again, why wouldn't so. you bring someone in that could speak to her? Exactly. Like a social worker bring someone or who's something. French. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. So, okay. yeah, I'm not sure, but it's still like, really? Like, just, you're just going to take, like, you believe that this woman is abusing her and you're just going to accept her word as fact? Yeah, that's, that doesn't seem right. Yeah, that feels wrong. Yeah. And so another issue with this particular hospital stay was that, um, a consultant wrote able to discharge on Victoria's file, which meant the consultant meant that Victoria was physically able to leave the hospital, mm-hmm. not that she should because she was being abused, but it oh. was misunderstood that Victoria should go home with Marie Therese. And so she went home with Marie Therese. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So I'm like, I don't know what you expected people to understand that as. It feels um, like there's a lot of mismanagement already in this case, like in yeah, terms of her so health care. Yeah, it's re- like the amount of like miscommunications and like mismanagement is absolutely insane. Mm-hmm. And so um, there is a police constable uh, named Karen Jones who is assigned to check up on Victoria after this hospital visit. But she doesn't make a home visit because she is afraid of catching scabies from the furniture. So she never actually checks up on Victoria and there is no health worker who makes a follow-up visit either for fear of like the same reason. And so since they're living with Carl Manning now, um, they are now in the community of Herringi, I think, or Herringay. So they are assigned a new social worker. This is just another like subdivision of London. And this social worker's name is Lisa Arthur Worry. And so Lisa is a very new to social work. She only has 18 months experience and she needs supervision, but she doesn't have any. Um, and so in August, Lisa makes the first of her two visits to their flat. Uh, during the first visit, the flat was nice and clean and Victoria was well presented. However, Lisa didn't address Victoria directly or ask why she wasn't going to school I think after the second visit, Victoria and Lisa had maybe spent all of 30 minutes going together, like between now and the end of this case. And so Lisa's second visit wasn't until October, and it happened just days after Carl started forcing Victoria to sleep in the bathtub every night. And he has her do this because she's having trouble controlling her bladder and is 
um, wetting the couch that she is sleeping on every night. And so her trouble with Sorry. incontinence. Yeah. Just a side note. I just can't believe that she's living with these people and they haven't even given her a bed and like social workers. I know one of them just didn't even show up. But the fact that like no one seemed to care about that. Right. That's just really messed up. Well, it's like you're claiming that this person is your child and she's sleeping on your couch. Like, that's crazy. Um, and so, yeah, her trouble with incontinence is a, as a result of the beatings and fear that her aunt and her boyfriend have instilled in her. So it's kind of like a a cycle where, like, she's wetting the couch for fear of the beating, but then she's getting beat for wetting the couch. But then, yeah. And so they actually placed a black garbage bag in the bottom of the bathtub for her to sleep on. And they tied her hands and then tied her to the bathtub. And they don't clean the bathtub, so she's being forced to sleep in her own excrement. There's also no heat or light in the bathroom, and it's winter, so she needs heat. Um, I don't know if the bathroom's just not heated. I don't know what houses in London are like. I don't know exactly how that works, but it seems weird that there's no heat in the bathroom anyways. Um, and so when they feed her, they give her food on a plastic plate, but they don't untie her hands. And there's a quote um, from the inquiry into her death that says, Victoria could only eat by pushing her face into the plate like a dog might, except, of course, dogs aren't normally tied up in black bin liners, end quote. So he's saying that, like, dogs get fairer treatment than this little girl. That's horrific. Right? And so then in November, Marie Therese calls the social services saying that Carl had sexually assaulted Victoria. Um, she only did this because their social services worker, Lisa, had told them that if Victoria was at risk, they would get better housing. You're lying. Mm -mm. What the hell? Oh, she my didn't, God. She didn't quite <laughs> say it like she didn't say, oh, if your daughter's getting sexually abused, like, we'll, yeah. Like, yeah. she was just kind of like, oh, like, we prioritize the higher risk people for housing. Like, only if Victoria's life was really at risk would we consider, like, better housing for you guys. And so because then, the aunt is so <laughs> twisted. But they're going to see, like, I understand sexually abusing children is horrific and terrible and awful. But they're going to yeah. see that as worse than being tied up in a bathtub sitting in her own excrement than yeah. like as for housing you know what i mean like i i don't know if i worded that properly but like i would have i guess they don't know that that's being done to her just by word yeah, it's but, like, like how much of that is the social workers seeing like yeah it's crazy because yeah oh, that would warrant like yeah her life is in danger but yeah yeah um so yeah they go to the social workers office with Carl and Victoria. So, like, all three of them go. And so it's explained to them that the only way they're going to get their new flat is if Victoria is examined and Carl is arrested. And so then Marie Therese, like, withdraws her allegation against Carl after that. Would that not have been a clue to them? That, mm -hmm. <laughs> like, shady shit's going on? No? Okay. Well, <laughs> Yeah, it doesn't it doesn't make sense to me to bring yeah. along the yeah. like sexual abuser, abuser to the allegation of his sexual abuse. Like that doesn't make sense to me. To be like, hey, we want a new house, all three of us, even though my boyfriend's it, it, sexually abusing my daughter, quote unquote daughter. Yeah. What? <laughs> yeah, it doesn't make sense to me at all. Oh my um, gosh. But yeah, they don't press charges because they're unfounded, as far as we know. Um, and so the social worker's office didn't investigate this claim afterwards, which is even crazier to me that this family, there have been reports of abuse. The quote unquote mom, like Aunt Marie Therese, is like, oh, yeah, there's sexual abuse, too. And they're just like, OK, go on your way. Like, there's no follow -up. Yeah, that's not right. That's something's going, like, something's not right in that service and social yeah. service. And so, um, 
I think they might have moved afterwards or maybe they just ignored the social worker because Lisa had like called them. She had written notes and left messages and like tried to visit them, but like no one answers the door when she goes there. And so Lisa Mm. thinks that they moved back to France and is just kind of like, hey, whatever. It's France's obligation now, not ours kind of thing. Yeah, basically, but doesn't attempt to like reach out to any like French social workers. Mm -hmm. And so for the next four months, Victoria is being starved and tortured daily. And during these four months, Marie Therese takes Victoria to church where she claims that her condition is being caused by the devil. Um, And she has started taking her to church because when she takes her to the hospital, like people get involved. But when she takes her to church, it's just between her and the priest. Oh, my gosh. That in and of itself is really messed up. Just Mm -hmm. like the priest should also have an obligation to report it if he suspects abuse. I do not see in any world where they shouldn't have that responsibility. Well, at that time in confession, yeah, confession and the fact that it's the devil that's doing it to her. Like, I'm not a very religious person, so I don't understand like the workings behind that. But like, I feel like if you're in a confession saying that the devil is doing this to your child, then you're going to believe that or like you go Mm -hmm. along with that you're not going to question that or think of other alternative possibilities as to how she's um, sustaining these injuries especially if the aunt is a prevalent member of the church because the priest is going to trust her word over someone else's exactly on february 24th during a trip to the church a member of the congregation sees victoria and tells marie therese that she needs to be taken to the hospital And so Marie Therese does. That's one thing is that Marie Therese always takes her to the hospital when people tell her that she should. I feel like not a lot of abusers do that. Not that that I'm trying to be on her side. (laughs) Is that just to like cover herself though? To be like, oh, she, people are telling me to take her to the hospital. I'll go get her checked out just in case, but nothing's going to come of it. Like I know what happens. We're just going to go home afterwards. I think so. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, But anyway, for this particular instance, Victoria is taken to the hospital and is found to be suffering from malnutrition, multiple organ failure, and hypothermia. Wow. Wow. Right? Okay. See, like, the context of this case for our listeners, like, we did this in our forensic parasitology class when we were in university. We did not have this context to the case. Like, we were told, oh, um, she came in said they were scabies, social uh, service thought, like, were scared that scabies were there, so it was never investigated. So to hear, like, the extent of the abuse is quite shocking. Yeah, because it's like, I would have answered our lab questions completely different yeah. had we had all of these, like, all of this information, right? Yeah. Like, it's just... It's crazy, like multiple organ failure. Like, it's yeah. And she's what six at this time, or would she have been seven? I forget um, her age. It's two thousand. She was born in nineteen ninety one, so I think she would have been around nine, eight or nine. Oh, okay. Yeah, it doesn't make That's it like any if, better or anything, but like still, she's young. Yeah, That's like effed. Even if like the family's still claiming scabies, scabies cannot cause all of that. Yeah. Like that would would that not it, have been a sign? Like I'm just, there's yeah, so like many it questions. Definitely, mark. it definitely doesn't cause hypothermia. I'm pretty yeah, sure they failure. just cause yeah. Like I'm pretty sure they just cause rashes well, <laughs> and itchiness. And another another thing with scabies is that it's transmitted through like skin to skin contact. Mm-hmm. So both Marie Therese and Carl should have also had scabies. Had As Victoria had yeah. scabies? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And so it was actually reported that her body temperature was so low that it couldn't be read by medical equipment. Holy crap. That's devastating. So, yeah, right? And like, so she's I don't basically know how- a walking corpse, mm-hmm. essentially, at this oh, point. Yeah. Literally 100%. a walking corpse. Yeah. Which is heartbreaking because she's been abused for two years. Yeah. That's disgusting. Um, And so she was reported of having 128 injuries, and the doctor said that this was, quote, the worst case of child abuse I've ever encountered, end quote. Wow. 
which is disgusting. And so the next day, on February 25th, 2000, there had been no contact made with Victoria, so the Herringy Social Services closed her case, and they tell Lisa to complete her paperwork, and there is no further action needed, and later that day, around 3.30 p.m., Victoria was pronounced dead in a London hospital. Wow. What the hell? Right? Like, I don't understand. It makes me so sad. And so then on f- the next day, on February 26, 2000, Marie Therese and Carl Manning were arrested. When police interview Marie Therese, she is evasive and obstructive and doesn't cooperate in any way. Whereas when Carl is arrested, he is very open about the abuse he performed on Victoria. He admits to punching her, using a shoe to beat her, as well as taking a bicycle chain to her body and head. Um, when investigators were searching the apartment, Carl had tried to clean up evidence of abuse with bleach. However, the investigators were still able to recover blood samples from the bath and the walls, and there was blood on the furniture in the living room and the bedroom as well. So even though he tried to clean it up, they were still able to find blood in all of these places. And so uh, one of the um, detectives actually said that, quote, we managed to recover many, many samples of blood. Now, given that they had already been cleaned, I think that they gave it, I think that gave an indication of exactly what had happened here. She had been assaulted regularly and severely, and she had bled. And even though they had attempted to cover this up, it must have been in abundance, end quote. And so even just that, that quote is kind of heartbreaking. Sorry. Yeah, I'm kind yeah, of, I, sorry. I, I'm just kind of speechless. It's yeah. <laughs> I right. don't know what to say. <laughs> like you would yeah. hope that this would have been noticed earlier, but with all of the people that it passed through for the detective, the detective, excuse me, to then see the scene and realize the extent of how horrific this was. Like, yeah, I like, I literally, I just don't really know what to say. <laughs> yeah, I don't understand point. how it got to this point, right? Like, yeah. there have been so many, like, opportunities yeah. for them to do something. And the amount of people that it had to pass through. Like, literally. why wasn't there just one, like, at least one, to have said something to kickstart or even to try no. and contact the real parents like i understand literally. she has documents and stuff but like where are the real parents during this all they like they <laughs> only got like a couple like messages from victoria saying that she was fine wow and so i think that everyone who they had come across kind of thought that victoria was marie Therese's daughter and didn't yeah. know right wow. like which how is easy it is, is it to forge documents in the 2000s it regarding must have that been though fairly easy like this was prior to 9 11 right so like security through borders and stuff mm, yeah it's completely different like we have never experienced pre-9-11 yeah. like passport travel security, and right? passport yeah so yeah yeah i don't oh know oh my gosh but yeah so um some more heartbreaking information In the garbage bins, they found discarded pieces of duct tape that was used to bind Victoria's feet and wrists, as well as the passport that confirmed the young girl as Anna. So that was kind of how they identified her was through this passport. Um, But they realized that the photo was not of the young girl who they have in the morgue. Um, And somehow they were able to identify her real parents and have them travel to London to identify their daughter. I don't know how they managed to identify her. Like, I don't know if Marie Therese ever came forward about that. And then in March, Lisa Arthur Worry and her manager were suspended on full pay, which is <laughs> disgusting considering they uh, <laughs> let this happen. On full pay. Oh right? Oh my gosh. Was this so the first back- social worker? No, the this last? is the one in. Um, like Herringy or Herringay or whatever the one, the young one who only had like 18 months experience and needed supervision. And so like her manager was supposed to work with her on all of these cases, but her manager didn't. (laughs) She just kind of effed off and was like, you got this. Mm, Okay. Yeah. So that's great. And so, um, Carl and Marie Therese's trial began in November of 2000 and by January of 2001, they were found guilty of murder and were sentenced to life in prison. 
Uh, Carl denied murder but pled guilty to child cruelty and manslaughter, while Marie Therese denied all charges. Uh, Marie Therese's defense was that Victoria was possessed by demons and that's why she was in the condition she was, not the abuse. Like she's meant, she's very clearly mentally ill. Like, yes. That has to be why. Because you can't deny all charges if you have, like, it's right in front of you. Like, Literally. you know what I mean? <laughs> like, I just, I can't wrap my head around it. Yeah. So oh. I would really like to, like, know more about the mental well being of Marie Therese. Yeah. Because it it's not good. Like, what led her to that point? You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And this could have been her first time, unless it was. But I'm like, how do you abuse a child like this if you have no experience in abusing children? Or she had kids before. Yeah, like I think one source said that she had. I was either two or three sons. Like before the time. Yeah, I think they they moved out at this point, or perhaps she had killed them, just like Victoria. Right, like. Yeah, We don't know, like, what's her experience? How many other kids had she done this? Because it was such a common practice for, like, people who lived in, like, high society or whatever, going mm-hmm. to the poverty-stricken countries and being like, hey, your kid can come live with me. Like, we'll get them school and we'll give them a chance at a better life. And then those kids are horribly abused and never seen again. Yeah. Wow. That's... Yeah. So that's heartbreaking. <laughs> Yeah, um, and Carl, um, during the trial, said, quote, you could beat her and she would not cry at all. She could take the beatings and pain like anything, end quote. I don't have words for that. Um, however, he did show shame about his actions, while Marie Therese showed absolutely no remorse for her actions, And during the trial, it even came out that she had attempted to use a hammer to break Victoria's toes. And neither of them actually gave an explanation of why they did what they did to her. So no one knows why this poor girl died. Um, Even if it was a demon, even if it was, what is breaking her toes going to do to get rid of it? Literally. Like, what is scolding her with boiling water gonna do what is tying her up gonna do like get a priest do an exorcism like exactly boom, it's like if you, be- <laughs> if you believe this is an actual legitimate demon take her to the church and perform an exorcism because that is your belief right like yeah you don't need to beat yeah. the demon out of her that's not how it's that just works. a catch-all at that point it's just a safety net of an excuse for right what they're doing to her wow despicable Yeah. Um, And so a couple months later in May of 2001, an inquiry into Victoria's death was started. And so it is the first in Britain to use special powers to look at everything from the role of social services to police child protection arrangements. So it's kind of like they're kind of asking the questions that we're asking, right? Like, why did this little girl die? Like, yeah, large scale, like shortfalls allowed this to Mm -hmm. happen or whatever. And so this inquiry is being led by Lord Lamming, who is a former chief inspector of social services. Um, There's some controversy over whether or not he was the best person to lead this inquiry, but he did, so whatever. Um, Victoria's parents attend the inquiry, and this is the first time that they are exposed to the full extent of their daughter's injuries. So this is horribly traumatic for them. Um, The inquiry called 230 witnesses to testify, including Carl and Marie Therese. And so when... Sorry to interrupt. That's okay. But like, wouldn't you think they would sit the parents down and explain to them the circumstances of what had happened before throwing them into the inquiry? Like, what's the You know? (laughs) Yeah, Just no, not. I was thinking the same thing. Like, maybe sit them down in a private area yeah. with, like, an, a forensic nurse. Because I know that they're often used to, like, help patients through traumatic situations and mm-hmm. explain the injuries. Like, why wasn't that done? Yeah. Exactly, right? Like, it seems so harsh to be like okay you're just gonna sit down in this and it's just gonna be horribly traumatic for you but like sorry tough luck because yeah. I think they weren't present maybe at the trial where they like went into detail okay. about some of these things like yeah. I don't know if they kind of chose to remove themselves from maybe the more horrific details but then they had no choice for this inquiry because they were like yeah like 
why did our daughter die? Like what happened? How could yeah. you allow this? Um, and so when Marie Therese takes the stand, she is like shrieking on the top of her lungs, refusing to sit down. She denies any blame. She actually tries to shift the blame onto Victoria's parents by accusing them of not being properly married. Um, I don't know <laughs> what? what her goal is with that. Like, I don't understand. It's like, I killed your daughter because you weren't properly married. Like, is that supposed to be like, I'm teaching you a lesson to not procreate when you're not married? Like, you well, know, they had like seven children, right? What? Like, <laughs> yeah, I don't understand oh, my God. the point of that, right? Like, yeah, so very severely mentally ill. Um, and then in November of 2002, because this inquiry went on for like years, I could imagine with the amount of witnesses that they called on stage. <laughs> You're not right? going to get like, that done in like a month. <laughs> well, and I think they tried to do a really thorough job of like, yo, we want all the answers. Yeah, rightfully so. Like, I, I can appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah. They didn't get all the answers because there's so much like, not hearsay, but like, not oxymorons, but contradictory evidence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, there's just, and there was no paper trails Word and no mouth. anything. Yeah. yeah, so it's just all over the place, which is really unfortunate. In November 2002, Lisa Arthurwery and her manager were dismissed for gross misconduct, gross misconduct following the disciplinary hearing. Uh, Lisa was in a very fragile state during the inquiry as the press had spent the entire time since Victoria died demonizing her since Lisa was quote unquote responsible for Victoria's last seven months of her life, even though she had seen her for a total of seven minutes in that time, um, Lisa was still made the scapegoat for the f failure of the entire system. Um, however, it's not so much that she was evil and was like willfully ignoring the evidence, but it's more likely that she was just young and experienced, overworked and incompetently managed. So there just needed to be like, a supervisor above her, like helping her out with this and like kind of directing her a little bit more. And then in August of 2002, Carol Baptiste, who is one of the key social workers in the case, uh, was found guilty of failing to attend the inquiry and was fined. Uh, she's actually the first person to be charged with failing to give evidence at a public inquiry. And so once she finally participated in the inquiry, she fought back against what Lisa was alleging against her and actually admitted that she didn't read Victoria's file properly. And then she asks Victoria's parents for forgiveness. How do you not read a file properly? Like you have I information just, in the file, you read it. And that's, you read the file properly. Properly. Yeah, I think this girl was like Lisa's manager who just didn't care. Of like, <laughs> why are you in the social work? Like, literally. Like, <laughs> Oh my gosh, this is so frustrating to me. <laughs> yeah, literally. It's like, why Like why wouldn't you read the file? Like, you're just going to skim over it? Like, do keywords not just jump out at you? Like, go work an office job. Like, go work literally. customer service. Why are you in social work with children if you're not going to, like, advocate for children? Oh my gosh. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. In July 2008, Victoria's mom, um, Birdie... Uh, rebukes her criticism for of her for letting Victoria go with her aunt. So the parents are being widely criticized for letting Victoria go with this person. But she explained how African families usually place more trust in relatives than in the West. And so she kind of says that Marie Therese like held up a Bible and swore on it to convince them to let Victoria stay with her. And so it's kind of like what I said, like they promise to give them a better life yeah. and to like they want they only they're doing it from a good place in their heart like they just want the best for their kid which they can't give them so they trust this other person which with it being a relative too like you would like to exactly. hope and trust that your relative's going to take good care of you exactly or of your child sorry mm -hmm. yeah like if you're going to trust anyone it should be family right like um and so as a result of victoria's death the entire child protection system was overhauled there was a new act of parliament brought in and there are new guidances issued to social workers. The government set up a regulatory agency called the General Social Care Council, as well as the Social Care Institute for Excellence, which are designed to promote higher standards of practice. Um, 
I feel like those should have been around. Sorry to cut you off. That's okay. I feel like those should have already been around. You know what I mean? Like some sort yeah. of like watchdog yeah. for social service workers. Right. I agree. It's the one time like it's unfortunate that like she had to die for this to come into like mm-hmm. fruition, right? Like but unfortunately, unfortunately that's typically the case too. Like you're yeah, not gonna like, see change unless something devastating kicks happens. that change in motion and makes people like genuinely think about what happened. Yeah, you don't realize like issues like where you're missing things until there's a case that shows you yeah. blatantly you yeah. are missing these things. Yeah. Um and so child protection officers um used to have low status but now their training and relevance is seen as vital as a result of this case. And Victoria's father says that he doesn't like to think of her life as lost because it resulted in a change in childcare for the better. And so it will help other kids in the future. Um, And him and his wife actually started a campaign to build a school for children in the Ivory Coast so the parents won't feel the need to let their children be taken away for education. And the school actually teaches 360 children now, which is awesome. Yeah, that's really good. That's yeah. It's nice that it, there was a bittersweet ending to it all. Yeah. Like yeah, there was a good outcome after everything happened. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it's but, uh, it's devastating what her parents had to go through, but I'm glad that they were able to see this as like a component of change. Like they're still deeply yeah. affected, obviously, but like they started a school for now 360 children so that they don't have to be taken to these other continents. Like yeah, it's exactly. amazing that they were able to, to do that out of their grief yeah no kidding right like I couldn't imagine losing a child this way Mm -hmm. and then like having the like mental clarity to start a school yeah I guess like like that's phenomenal on them I'm glad too like I had I had written down some questions like as you were going on and like one was like what was the outcome of social services but like I'm glad that with that inquiry, they did like that whole overhaul because if mm-hmm. they continued through with this inquiry and then decided that's unfortunate, you know what? I'm sorry, right. but like, let's go to the next case. Like that would have been the most infuriating thing. And I'm glad that that wasn't the case. Mm-hmm. Um, and I understand that there are very many cases where this doesn't happen and children go through the same thing, but like, at least now there's some precedent moving forward. You know what yeah. I mean? This case kind of reminds me of the one of the young boy in LA. Um, there was a Netflix like documentary series made about him. And he was like living with his, I think it was his biological parents. And they like locked him in a closet and like beat him up. And he had ended up passing away. But like social services, again, were like horribly neglectful and didn't do their job. Sorry, I just looked up the case. It was Gabriel Fernandez. Right. Oh, I've heard of that name. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah. I never actually watched the documentary, but I know of it. The, there's a lot of parallels between this case and that one. Like, it's crazy. What year did that um, one occur? Late. Do you know off the top like of your t- head? Around or 2010. Have- I want to say like 2008. Uh, it says he... Uh, 2013, I think is what it says. Oh, I'm wrong. Okay, so around the 2010s mark. Mm-hmm. But still, like, okay, so that would have been what? That was in America? Yeah. Then? That was in LA. So, like, I don't know. Like, I, I, I understand it's interdisciplinary. Like, one's in the UK or wherever in Europe it is. Mm-hmm. And then now this is happening in the States. Would you not look for previous cases globally to try and, like, help with social services and like the precedent around that and laws and guidelines and whatnot you or is that like too much to, to ask so. for that's too much to ask for because yeah okay that's that's yeah that's such a giant scope of work that like that would take years and years and years to in order to like fully redo the entire social working system in yeah. the whole world isn't social Especially- work underfunded in many places too Probably, yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's definitely I think that not. would have played a part in, mm-hmm. I think, some of this, unfortunately. Well, I think people just don't 
recognize the importance of what social workers are doing. Yeah. Like. Well, it's not happening to them or their children. So why would they? Yeah. Want it doesn't to- immediately affect them. Yeah. Right. So they don't care. Yeah. Which is an issue that this world needs to kind of get over. So but yeah, so that's all I have on Victoria Klimby. Um, it's heartbreaking, but hopefully from it, we can kind of learn what needs to get done and what shouldn't get done and kind of move forward like the UK did and kind of restructure a little bit because mm-hmm. this shouldn't be a regular thing that's just happening to children. No, I agree. Um, well, thank you for dropping that devastating case study to us on a Sunday morning. <laughs> yeah, sorry so, about that. <laughs> I appreciate that. Mm-hmm. Um, and so as you guys, listeners may know with the title, we are going to be switching into forensic parasitology now. Um, given what we just heard from Journey, you know, it's it's clear that parasites were not a leading cause in this case. It was just misconduct and pardon my French, asshole people that were just abusing an innocent, um, what's the word, like vulnerable child that isn't going to protect themselves. Anyways, we will now shift it over to Rebecca to kind of cover the the background of parasites. And then we're going to tie this into a discussion as to, you know, how parasites really ultimately did play an important role in this because if like too long don't read version if they didn't say it was scabies they probably would have investigated it further at the end of the day like that was a very that was a crux in this investigation um so yes rebecca do you want to kind of sidetrack into um parasitology and then give us a bit more context into how this happened I would be happy to. Um, So as we usually sort of do it, I'm going to talk about like the general science of parasitology before getting into like its forensic application. Um, And I also wanted to just share some info about uh, the history of it because it's pretty fascinating to me, honestly, even though parasites are kind of icky. And I just want to kind of give an example of like how long we've had the science to deal with parasites. So this really shouldn't have been an issue in this case. Um, so simply put, parasitology is the study of parasites and their interaction and relationship to their hosts. It is a branch of the larger study of microbiology, but it is influenced by other fields such as immunology, biochemistry, and entomology. So the study of parasitology is primarily concerned with three types of organisms. These are protozoas, helminths, which are parasitic worms, and arthropods. However, occasionally it also involves studying other organisms based on whether or not they fit the description of a parasite. So in order to really understand more about parasitology, of course, we first need to know what a parasite actually is. So a parasite is essentially any living organism that derives its nourishment from other living organisms, and they are almost always harmful to the host in some form or another. I say almost always uh, because there is research to suggest that there's a couple specific species of parasite that might actually help humans in fighting autoimmune diseases. Um, However, for the sake of this episode, because harmful parasites are just far more common in the ecosystem, I'm not really going to go into the good ones on this, but maybe in the future, if there's enough interest, we can talk about the medical advantages of them. The history of parasitology, as I mentioned earlier, is pretty neat. And like all the other fields of science that are prevalent today, at some point in history, there were many widely believed hypotheses uh, for what parasites are, their purpose in nature and why they existed. But of course, many of those theories have shifted and changed throughout the history. So the first known written record of parasites uh, was actually in an Egyptian papyrus, uh, Ebers, or Ebers, I apologize if I'm mispronouncing that, um, which dates back to 3000 to 400 BC. The papyrus Ebers contains information regarding medical and uh, herbal treatments of many ailments from that time, and it's actually considered to be one of the most important uh, 
papyruses, papyruses that we have found from Egypt. I've never known how to say that word. I apologize. Um, it's papyrus. Okay. At least that's how I've been taught. That's how I heard it is papyrus. Okay. That's how I, I would say it too. Okay, good. So a little side tangent. I would also say a papyrus, and it's thanks to a Saturday Night Live skit with Ryan Gosling about the <laughs> font papyrus. Um, so our sources are solid. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> solid sources. Um, but besides that, in this papyrus, it identified multiple parasites, which included roundworms, guinea worms, and threadworms, as well as some tapeworms that, oddly enough, today we can't identify. So I don't know if maybe the species simply went extinct and we don't have record of them and maybe or maybe it's just like a a translation thing that we're calling them something different but before i continue with the history i did just want to share this little fun fact about mummies and parasites um so of all of the egyptian mummies that scientists have tested for like parasites and all that sort of thing 22% of them tested positive for malaria, which is caused by plasmodium, uh, and 17% were positive for schistosomiasis, which is caused by parasitic flatworms. So do you think that those parasites played a role in why they are now mummies? Like that they they passed away from the parasites kind of thing? Like... Played a role or in that. I think parasites have a positive role in the mummification. Oh, another question. I think both of those are <laughs> have potential. <laughs> um, I do are know that said, some of the you're mummies. You're not an expert in mummies, Rebecca. You don't know the answers to these. In <laughs> mummies and parasites. <laughs> Let me just pull up my thesis here. Um, <laughs> but I do know that like some of the mummies they identified that were positive for them. The cause of death was definitely these parasites, but this statistic is just kind of like, of all of them tested, this many was positive. It doesn't really mean this many died from it, but they were present in their system at death. Okay, that's kind of cool. Mm-hmm. Uh, so just moving on from Egypt, up until the 17th to 18th centuries, it was widely accepted that uh, many bugs in like, animal species, more so bugs and insects, uh, were born out of spontaneous generation. So this means that it was believed life could arise from non-living things. So like a, uh, sorry, like a piece of meat that had gone bad, it was believed that the maggots on the meat generated out of the rotten meat instead of like going to it to like actually decomp it. Yeah. Um, So parasites were not excluded from this belief, as it was thought that parasites were born directly in or on the body of animals and humans that were infected. So I don't believe people thought that they could transmit it to other people. It was simply that if you had them, it's because you were unlucky and they just grew out of our bodies, which is weird. And I don't know why that theory existed, but they didn't have microscopes, so they couldn't really see the insides Um, So this theory, thankfully, was eventually rejected for what we now know regarding how they're born. Uh, So in 1680, the person credited with the invention of the microscope, whose name was uh, Antoine van Leeuwenhoek, he was a Dutch scientist, and he was the first person to actually observe and describe many types of parasites that we can't see with the human eye. So through his research, in 1680, he identified and described the parasite that causes malaria, which I mentioned earlier is called plasmodium, and it is a unicellular organism, so of course we can't see it. He then sent his findings through various letters to the Royal Society of London, where he described the plasmodium as, quote, little animals. Um, Then in 1882, the study of parasites became more prevalent, uh, with many more scientists beginning to study them. With one of the notable scientists at the time, whose name was Robert Koch, he was a German physician and bacteriologist who identified the parasite that causes tuberculosis, which was called Mycobacterium tuberculosis. And it was because of this that he then developed techniques for culturing this bacteria in laboratory for further studies on preventing tuberculosis. Yes. I have a fun fact. Oh, I love fun facts. So the drug... (laughs) 
that was used to cure tuberculosis was actually the main chemical from it was um, from like jet fuel or rocket fuel that was used in World War II. Really? That like Germans had used in World War II. Yeah. That is so strange. I never would have thought they'd use like fuel for medication. How do you make the connection that this could be useful in saving lives? Interesting. Um, I'll find where I wrote that down because it just feels false. (laughs) (laughs) It was derived from a chemical that was used as rocket fuel for planes and flying bombs in World War II by the Germans. And so, sorry, it was one of the first antidepressants because when they gave the drug to tuberculosis patients, they immediately cheered up and some of the doctors thought that the effect on the brain could like cure depression. So it like cured tuberculosis and was also uh, one of the first like preceptors maybe. That's not the right word, but like precursors for Prozac. Oh. That's crazy. I was going to say, I wonder if because it's like chemicals found in jet fuel if it just makes them loopy because it's a little toxic and it's so toxic to the mysobacterium that it would just kill them right who knows i mean someone to bring jet fuel back for antidepressants (laughs) and then we'll all be cured (laughs) here's your prescribed jet fuel enjoy yeah (laughs) yeah anyway i just wanted to share that because i thought that was so neat that like jet fuel was used to like cure tuberculosis that's very interesting super neat Thank you Um, for sharing. Yeah, thank you. (laughs) So prior to Coach's discovery of these mysobacteriums, it was actually believed that tuberculosis was an inherited disease. Um, But because of his discovery, he ended up being awarded the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine for his work on infectious diseases in 1905. And then in, sorry, not 19, in 1897, a British physician and scientist whose name was Sir Ronald Ross had discovered the malaria parasite, uh, or sorry, he didn't discover it, but he discovered that the malaria parasite is transmitted by the bite of a mosquito. And this discovery led to the development of methods for controlling malaria uh, simply by trying to control kind of mosquito populations. And I think this is where like the bed nets come from, if you know what I mean. Um, and so Ross was also awarded a Nobel prize for physiology or medicine in 1902 for this discovery. So all that to say, we have had a good understanding of parasites for a very long time. So it should have been pretty easy to detect scabies, uh, and learn that she didn't have them, but I'm going to move on from the history for now. Um, but as you can see by the history, it's, Parasitology has almost always been studied within a medical context. But how can parasitology be used in a forensic context? Before I get into that, I want to say I expected to find a lot of information on forensic parasitology. Uh, However, most of the information I could find was blocked by paywalls by like the scientific journals, which you guys know the struggle of that through research. So um, stupid. Paywalls should I not know. exist for knowledge-based information. Let me learn for free. I just yeah. want to know more about forensic parasitology. <laughs> Apparently, too, the authors don't get a cent of this money. It's all of the um, online sources, like the uh, whatever the hell they're called. Really? They, yeah. From my understanding, I could be totally wrong, but from my understanding, when I learned about... Um, not databases. What are they called? Like, um, I know I what you're talking. Of, like yeah. Wiley and like Elsevier yeah, yeah, yeah. and stuff like that. I can't remember yeah. the name of those, but Doctor based- Stinson was talking to us a little bit about it in Honor Sem about like the world of publications and academia and how like authors don't get a cent. So typically, you could email the author of the paper and be like, "Hey, can I have your access to your uh, paper?" And they'll be like. Sure, here you go, and just send you a PDF of it. That's crazy because I'd much rather pay the author than just yeah. like pay the like database. Yeah, yeah, me too. Anyway, sorry, side tangent. <laughs> oh, it's all good. I uh, I was honestly probably going to go into that tangent as well because I was very annoyed by the paywalls trying to research this. <laughs> um, but with that being said, I've collected as much information as I reasonably could about forensic. Uh, its use in forensics. 
So to get started with that, in a criminal investigation, parasites are commonly used to identify the time of death of a victim, uh, to determine if a person has been in a particular location, as well as to identify potential sources of infection and subsequent death. So I'm not going to get too much into the investigation on the time of death because we've covered it quite extensively in our forensic entomology episode. This is actually one of these instances where forensic entomology and parasitology are like really overlapping. Um, But basically, the reason parasitology can be used in time of death investigations is because many of the insects that are present on a corpse to help with decomposition are technically by definition parasites. So, for example, blowflies and flesh flies, which are often present within the first couple stages of decomp, are considered parasites. So with regards to using parasites to identify if someone was in a particular location, there are many parasites that exist uh, within like certain regions, uh, but can't exist elsewhere. So like it's like to do with climate and to do with like population and all that sort of thing. Um, But basically, this just means that not everywhere in the world is going to have the same types of parasites or species of parasites. Particularly, parasitology is used extensively in investigations of wildlife trafficking and illegal captive breeding. Uh, Because, for example, uh, there's also certain parasites, such as some parasitic worms and mites, that commonly live within or on a wild host. So like a wild animal just doing its own thing. Um, However, these parasitic species cannot survive if the animal's been removed from the wild and bred captively. So simply in captivity, these certain parasitic worms just, they don't survive usually because people will try to treat them and through breeding, they eventually just kind of breed them out. So the presence of parasites in blood and fecal samples or the lack of can lend support to cases involving investigation of captive breeding, as if there's no presence of these parasitic species that only exist in wild animals, it can act as evidence that an animal has been bred captively um, and potentially illegally. This technique can similarly be used in human criminal investigations. So if there is, say, an unidentified sorry, unidentified body at a crime scene, investigators may be able to analyze uh, blood or fecal or skin samples for the presence of parasites. And as I mentioned earlier, it can be used to identify if someone's been in a certain location. As I was saying earlier, not all parasites are everywhere in the world. So if there's evidence of a parasite that's not local to the location where a victim's body was found, uh, then it can help... I investigators determined that the body may have, or sorry, the person may have been killed in another region and possibly dumped in this new location. Um, And further, that could help identify the victim because they might be able to put out like posters and like facial recreations in the city or in the region they believe that they went missing from. Could it also help in a way that like, If certain parasites are found from different locations and say the individual's unidentified, could this help further identify where they like spent most of their time in their life kind of thing, like where they grew up, where they spent the majority of their life and then moved somewhere else? Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So I couldn't find um, very much information at all on this and I didn't want to give misinformation, so I didn't include it, Mm -hmm. but there was actually a case, um, and this kind of ties into the next point I had about uh, using it in investigations, but there was a case in India where a body was found that had a very specific type of parasite. So it was Mm -hmm. like native to only one region in India or something like that. And so they took samples from all of these suspects and found that only one of the suspect also had parasites from that region. So oh. that was able to kind of tie him to the crime scene and make him like the primary suspect. And it did end up being the killer of this person. Wow. Interesting. That's mm-hmm. really cool. Uh, so basically my next point is that just more uh, summarized. Um, <laughs> it can be used to narrow down a suspect pool. So 
if it occurs, the homicide within a geographical location that has parasites specific to the region, investigators can take samples from the suspects. And then if the suspect doesn't have the parasites, then they can rule them out or at least kind of make them lower on the suspect list. Obviously, this doesn't happen in every case because there's also parasites that are common to plenty of places and it just wouldn't give us enough to narrow down. But in special circumstances, this could be very useful. So parasitology is also useful in identifying possible cause of death, such as in Victoria Klimby's case. So in Klimby's case, the medical examiner who would be conducting an autopsy would probably have had to look for evidence of scabies, given that was one of the reasons they gave for all this abuse. Um, But after ruling out any sign of having or previously having scabies, the ME would be able to conclude that parasites were not, in fact, a role in Klimby's death and would then be able to look for other causes of it. And then it's also useful in similar situations where an individual may die in suspicious circumstances, um, but the presence or lack thereof of parasites in their body would be able to help determine whether or not their death was natural or suspicious. So like if someone's body say is found they died at home and there doesn't look like there's any kind of trauma or something to their body then a medical examiner may very well test for parasites and then if they're present then they can say oh this could have been the cause of death and then they would go into that further so overall parasitology is more common in a medical context but it can be used to assist in various types of investigations, such as wildlife and homicide cases, to provide evidence of a person's whereabouts, cause of death, and time of death. I apologize for not having more info on it with regards to its specific forensic uses, but it does appear that a forensic investigation of parasites would be no different than a medical one. It just means that the findings in the medical investigation are going to be used in a legal context. So the last thing I wanted to say about parasites is that they come in many shapes and sizes. Uh, Some parasites, such as insects like ticks, mites, blowflies, and bedbugs, would all be considered external parasites as they prey on the outside of their host for nourishment. So like they would they would land on the skin and try to get like the blood externally. Um, And then there's also internal parasites, such as many types of parasitic worms, like the roundworms and flatworms, because they need to get inside of the host to find nourishment. So I believe it's roundworms. They are a parasitic infection of the intestines. So they would likely you'd likely get roundworms from eating something that was infected with it, such as like pig, like pork or beef. And then they would kind of lay eggs in your intestinal tract and prey on the nourishment from in there. And additionally, there are many insects that people may commonly believe to be parasitic when in fact they are really just a host for a parasite to get from one place to another, uh, such as mosquitoes. I initially thought mosquitoes were parasites and that malaria was specifically caused by like mosquito bites. But turns out mosquitoes are basically like a little taxi cab that carry around Plasmodium malari or malari, (laughs) which In turn, uh, when the mosquito bites a person, if the mosquito is infected with the plasmodium, then it would end up transmitting it to the host through the bite. And then the plasmodium malari, which is microscopic, would get into a human and infect them that way. And then finally, some parasites can cause more damage than others. And even though they sound gross and all harmful, they do have an important role in the ecosystem through regulating uh, kind of species sizes and like populations. And also there's some antibiotics that are actually made out of parasites, which is kind of gross, but I guess if it helps, it helps. Yeah, um, I've never thought about like using them for good, I guess. Like right? that's kind of like, weird, yeah. I know, I hear parasite and I just assume bad. Everything yeah. bad, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, but then there's also some parasites such as leeches and maggots that are sometimes grown in laboratories for medical purpose. So I know you guys have likely heard of blood shedding through leeches like in medieval times, but there are some cases where hospitals do still use leeches, uh, to help people bloodshed. Really? 
Uh huh. Actually, I think my cousin who just uh, graduated from nursing school, I think they had leeches in one of the laboratories he worked in. Wow. Don't they help with blood clotting? I believe so. Yeah. Yeah. Because my dad used to tell me about them when I was younger. So I was like never afraid of leeches. But everyone else was like, oh my goodness, they just like suck your blood and then you die. But I was like, no, like you put them on like open wounds to kind of like stop the bleeding. Mm -hmm. Oh. Was my, I always like, had the, if they bite you, they drink your blood like a straw or yeah, drink your blood <laughs> as if they're like drinking it through a straw and just get all of it out of you. But that would have been yeah, nice yeah. information to know as a child. <laughs> right? I would have been less scared. I, <laughs> I was terrified of leeches. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I don't think I've um, ever come across a leech in nature either, like actively no, doing stuff. So it's like quicksand. It you think that yeah. it's more prevalent than it is, but. And the Bermuda nope. Triangle. Yeah. Anyways. Um, <laughs> is it like the saliva of the leech or like that causes the blood clotting? Like I don't – this might not I be know a, a question for this leeches. episode, but like I don't remember what it was that like causes – I just briefly looked it up uh, and it says leeches release proteins and peptides that thin blood and prevent clotting. Oh. So it improves circulation oh. and prevents tissue death. And they leave behind a small Y-shaped wound that usually heals without leaving a scar. Oh, neat. Okay. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, but they are basically just an example, like I said earlier, of like some parasites do more damage than others. So like uh, the malaria and tuberculosis ones, are they can be deadly. Like they can kill a person, but leeches leeches are just kind of hungry and they just, they want a little snack and then they move on. (laughs) Um, but yeah, so leeches used in laboratories and then also occasionally maggots are grown in medical laboratory to help clean up dead tissue, say in like after the fact, I don't know if it'd be used in an operating room for sanitary reasons, but basically like they, they clean up medical waste that Mm. doctors don't want to deal with. (laughs) I remember, um, sorry to interrupt. Like I can't remember what episode we talked about this briefly in, but, um, Quick side story is I think it was my grandmother on my mom's side. She had broken her foot or something. She had a cast on and she remembers it being like very itchy. But when she got the cast off, it was like filled with maggots. But the maggots ended up saving her foot because they were eating the like necrosis that was happening, the dead skin in her foot. Yeah. So it actually ended up saving her foot from being amputated. But like absolutely disgusting that it was just infested with maggots yeah because maggots only eat dead tissue right like they don't feed on live tissue yeah so exactly that's another way in which like they're very useful like it's technically a parasite because it feeds on another living organism Mm -hmm. but it doesn't really harm the actual living organism Mm -hmm. it doesn't do anything good for us except for maybe (laughs) in that situation but that's so (laughs) gross (laughs) <laughs> that's a new fear is officially unlocked you're welcome <laughs> just hope you don't have to break anything anytime soon yeah no kidding so with all of that being said i still think parasites are kind of icky however they're very important to our ecosystem and can assist in forensic and medical investigations Not every forensic investigation is going to involve the use of parasitology and its evidence can't usually be used as like the main kind of uh, conviction factor, I guess. Uh, However, it can assist in kind of like putting facts together and making kind of like a storyline of maybe their location and time of death and possibly narrow down the suspect pool. So it can definitely help build a strong case, but it can't be the one reason someone is convicted. Yeah, it kind of makes me think of like entomology and palynology and like those kind of things. Like it's it's there to help provide context to a case, but at the end of the day, it's not really like your DNA evidence that's going to be the be all end all and uh, tie the case together or like yeah, yeah convict yeah exactly that's e- exactly I, I don't know where <laughs> I was going with that but I agree <laughs> um, but yeah that's all I've really got to say about parasitology right now 
Well, thank you for uh, that brief little lesson on parasitology. I always find it interesting. Like a lot of the sciences we learn about have their pros and cons to it. And especially this one in relation to the health of those that may be involved. Um, But now like, Now that we have a bit of context on the case itself and what parasites are, how they can play a role in investigations, I wanted to just kind of pose the question as in like what parasites were actually present in the case of Victoria Columbia. And again, like using this definition of parasite as in like a host and feeding basically very loosely so i wanted to get your opinions on that both of you yeah um in my opinion like the ant is a parasite because she's kind of like like sucking the life out of victoria and it's quite literally yeah i was gonna say the same because it kind of seems like she was just using victoria for sympathy yeah like going to the church to build relationships like oh my niece is or my i guess she'd call her daughter is like possessed by the devil and then everyone's like oh you're going through such a hard time and then but really i think yeah i think she just kind of wanted the social status of being like look at me i'm helping some kid from a like a another country that doesn't have access to education whatever like Mm -hmm. definitely just a parasite Yes. Yeah, and it's not so much that she's, like, getting nourishment from, mm-hmm. like, Victoria, but I, she's got to be getting some form of, like, satisfaction or something. Well, she was also Otherwise, she wouldn't be doing it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. She was also in it for, like, the housing and the perks and, like, the social service perks from it. Like, oh, I have exactly. a disheveled child. What can I get from this? So I'm going to continue even, with that. Yeah, like, even, like, the child benefit checks yeah. or whatever like i don't know if those are specific to canada right but like you get like 500 bucks a month per kid yeah yeah i don't know if that's exactly the right amount but like if she <laughs> claimed her as her kid right like then she'd be yeah. getting these like some these incentive to it yeah yeah and um, yeah most definitely harmful to the host or victoria yeah, yeah. i it's agree crazy I, that, like we can sorry to that's cut you off i was just gonna say like i know technically she might not be a parasite but like i think in terms of like a broad definition we yeah. can consider some humans parasitic <laughs> oh 100 yeah. percent, yeah um and then obviously like scabies parasite in itself not to say that yeah it was the cause of her injuries but like she they was using a that for sure yeah like that was very much involved and then um I think kind sorry, of- I think scabies is definitely the reason that this went on as long as it did because like you're saying mm-hmm. the social workers and officers were too scared to get it so they didn't go investigate further. Yeah. So exactly. while it wasn't it wasn't like actually present, it that parasite definitely played a role in this case, like an instrumental role. Yeah. And I like I don't know why the doctors weren't like, okay, she says scabies. Okay, let's test her for scabies. Yeah, let's and, like, go further with this to at least check it off or say no yeah. this isn't it. Exactly, um, right? And, like, scabies <laughs> rashes appear in, like, very specific areas. Yeah. yeah. And so, like, did the ant know that and only, like, harmed her in those areas to, like, further support the yeah. fact that she had scabies? Or was everyone just so uneducated that they didn't know? Yeah. No, I yeah, agree. I don't know. And then, like, kind of jumping off of your point, Rebecca, about how it impeded, essentially, the investigation, I, I wanted to know, like, what evidence – do you guys think was absent that could have changed this investigation or at least the way that people approached this investigation, um, how they viewed it and why was it absent at that point? Well, the absence of scabies definitely would have played a bigger role (laughs) if they paid attention to it more. Yeah. (laughs) I kind of jumped the gun on that question. (laughs) Yeah. That's okay. But you're completely right though. Like these questions are very much related like i mean like we were saying like even though this parasite wasn't technically involved in the case this is still very much a case of forensic parasitology because Mm -hmm. if they if they did their due diligence actually looked her over looked at the bigger picture Mm -hmm. a child would not pour boiling water on themselves to stop itching Mm -hmm. no simply wouldn't even if they were that itchy to the point of harming themselves 
why would boiling water be your first option? You know what I mean? As like a, a child under 10, I feel like you would take, at least my I myself would take other measures to try and relieve the itching than hot water because typically cold water helps itching. Hot water makes it worse. So yeah. I don't and know. if, if the kid is resorting to pouring hot water on themselves because their scabies infection is so bad, then look at their scabies infection and yeah. like actually try and like give them some form of relief that doesn't involve like burning exactly. themselves essentially. Exactly. Yeah. Um, this case is just a giant mess up. I didn't realize how horrific this case was. Yeah. Until same. you gave the full mm-hmm. rundown. Cause I mean, like you were saying, we did it in university and I remember it from that, but we were given a small summary of the case. Yeah. yeah. It, it basically like just for context, we were given, um, she went to go live with her aunt. Uh, she, the aunt said she had scabies, but upon investigation, um, you know, not much was done. She poured boiling water. She had these lesions. Uh, yeah. Social services did not investigate further because of the idea of scabies. Like, from from the main thing that we learned from the case study in university was that social support, like social services and police or investigators did not proceed further in fear of of getting scabies. So like no one went to the house to check. No one did X, Y, Z because they were scared of getting it themselves. When at the end of the day, it's scabies. Like you can treat that. Like, it's not like it's going to kill you. It's not life or death. You're going to be itchy for a little while and then you're going to go to the doctor and they're going to give you something for it. And you might have to isolate so you don't give it to others. And then you'll get better. Yeah. It shouldn't have been that bad, especially for people that are supposed to be protecting others and police officers who put themselves in harm's way every day. So yeah. what's a little bit of a rash? Yeah. Literally. Yeah. When I was no. like researching this, I had like little bumps on my legs. Oh um, no. <laughs> that I like woken up with and I was so itchy. And then I like made the mistake of like Googling, oh, what is scabies? How do you get scabies? How do you oh, cure no. scabies? And I was like, no. <laughs> and I literally, I was so itchy for the rest of the day. The hypochondriac so, in you is just like literally us with this case. I was freaking out. I was like, wow, I'm so glad I'm not on parasitology. <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, yeah. And then lastly, I know we've already kind of discussed this, but just kind of like the possible roles that these parasites in broad terms um, played in the abuse and murder of Victoria here. What you guys think? Like, I know we've already talked about it. So like if there's anything to add on to that, if you guys had that. Yeah, um, it's like you've kind of mentioned, like, did the aunt use that as an excuse? Like, did she go to the first hospital meeting and be like, oh, it's scabies, and then see that she got away with that? And then, like, expanded her form of abuse to be like, oh, I can mm-hmm. just blame it on scabies because that mm-hmm. worked the first time. Yeah. Like, how much of a role did that play? And I, I wonder, too, like, after the first doctor's visit, when they said she did have scabies, I believe that's what it was. Yeah. Right? Yeah, okay. After the Mm -hmm. first one, and they said she did have scabies, like, I wonder if that kind of built, like, made the abuse worse, because then maybe Mm -hmm. the aunt was like, oh, like, I know I used that an excuse, but the doctor said that she has them, so maybe she actually does, which would lead to the further abuse of, like, putting her in the bathtub Mm -hmm. and all of this. Like, it's the separation of her from the two of them, yeah. Kind of made them view her as, like, dirty. yeah. Yeah, exactly. It feels like it was gross negligence on the doctor's part to say Mm -hmm. she had scabies the first time. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. I agree. And going back to, like, I just kind of thought of what parasites were present in this case, broadly speaking. The uh, devil, I think, could be considered one, essentially, because the aunt's saying that this devil is possessing this daughter that's causing these things. And so, like... I think in a way you could come back and say that this possession could be seen as a parasitic um, well, relationship with Klimby. Going off of that too, like the church. Yeah. Like that plays a huge role in there because how much did they know? How much did they see? Like it's one thing if you enter a confessional and like you don't see the yeah. priest who you're confessing to. Like, Did they bring Klimby to church with them weekly? Yeah, um, I think oh, so. I, I don't, don't know, know if they went weekly. to church the whole time. 
or if it was just towards the end that she started going to church. Like, I don't know. But that was how, how she, that like, way. someone at church said you sh- she needs to go to the hospital like that's what kind of prompted yeah. very grateful for, for that yeah. person but it's just like mm-hmm. how many other people were in there and saw it mm-hmm. but heard either she has scabies or she's possessed by a demon so if it's the demon thing it's like oh yes, well she's in church are. she'll be cured but yeah. if it's the scabies thing they probably didn't want to go near her and try to help her because they yeah. themselves were scared of being infected yeah it's yeah. just the stigma around it like it's it happens it's scabies but like it's dirty if they see it. It's like bed bugs yeah. kind of thing. Like mm-hmm. crap happens. Houses have bed bugs, but like you take the proper precautions or you deal with it properly and it's over with. Another thing is that how much did they know about scabies at that time, right? Like Yeah. Did they have inf- like did they even have something to treat the scabies? Yeah. Right? Like how do we, we didn't even really- treat scabies. Sorry. I have no idea, actually. Let's maybe Google that. <laughs> Two most widely used treatments are permethrin cream and malathion lotion. So it's quite literally a topical cure. Literally. So also, what- I just want to note, sorry, I just found uh, scabies were first recorded in, they were initially called itch mites in 1687. So they've been around. So we've known they about were them. They've been around, Yeah. That's crazy because literally you apply this lotion one week and then the next week you apply it again and then it's pr- that's it. And like if you and then if the gone. scabies like still are staying, then you apply like another one like until they're gone. Like you just keep applying this lotion once a week. The, like I don't understand why there was so like I understand stigma and fear around things unknown to you. And like if they don't know what scabies are. Sure, there's some fear in that, but like, yeah, it's not gonna kill you. Like, it's not like we're talking Ebola or the Black Plague. Like, if you step in the way of them, you're dead. Like, that's not the case that we're dealing with here. So, at the end of the day, what else is causing this? Well, a lot of things we've discussed, but like, yeah, I don't know, just a lot of question marks. <laughs> well, yeah, right? Like, it's you just put a lotion on, like, it's not a big deal. Yeah. Really. And so Weird. again, why did the doctor if it was scabies, why did they not treat that or have the option to treat that rather than just saying it's not scabies? Well, literally, like you say, okay, Marie Therese, like if she does have scabies, here's a lotion. Here's a lotion. Go Apply to the it pharmacy. once a week. Yeah. Yeah, for exactly. 4 weeks or whatever, like not oh, you should just go back home and it'll it'll deal with it itself. Like I think there was like grave human error every step of the way. Yeah, in this case, I agree. like literally every every single step that could have went wrong went wrong because yeah. of human error. Yeah, yeah, I agree. No, it's just crazy. Well, um, on that note, do you guys have anything else to add to that, <laughs> or, or no? Yeah, I I have a link to the actual like full inquiry document. Whoa, wow, <laughs> document. <laughs> document i have a link to the full inquiry document um so if anybody wants that i'll put that in our sources and you guys can kind of go through and read like the actual outcome of like everything i didn't have a chance to read it because it's like 400 pages long but it's just light reading you know yeah exactly just a sunday afternoon yeah no biggie (laughs) yeah so if anybody wants that that'll be in our source list and you guys can go check that out to kind of learn more Incredible. About the um, gross negligence that happened in this case. Yeah. Well, thank you both so much for um, everything that you brought to the table today, as horrific or educational as it was. I found I learned quite a bit. So thank you both for that. Um, our next topic we're going to be discussing, it's kind of a different, like, yes, it's forensics related, but kind of a different way we're approaching this episode um we're going to talk about the mystery surrounding the isdal woman and then we're all just gonna kind of pose our own theories and it's going to be a bit more of a discussion-based episode um we've been finding that wow we actually enjoy talking to each other about things and (laughs) not just reading our notes so um a bit more discussions if you guys are listening to this episode before the isdal woman comes out 
let us know if you have any questions, any topics you want, uh, like discussed in that episode. Like we would love to hear if you even know of the Isdal woman case. I myself don't know anything. I found it actually online while scrolling in my black hole, uh, scrolling days. Um, but yeah, we're just kind of going to work together and split up into segments and have some fun with that. Um, <laughs> journey. Can you tell us where people can find us? Yes. So people can find us on Instagram, YouTube, and Facebook at What the Forensics. Our Twitter is WT Forensics PC. Our website is whatthefrensics.ca. And it has all of our like sources and source images and information about us and like what we've been up to. And then there's also our email, which is whatthefrensics at gmail.com, where you can reach out with any questions, comments, or concerns. And I've been updating the YouTube with just um, like basically images while our audio plays. So it's not us talking yet, but um, yeah, if you We're working on want it. something else to listen to us on, yeah, you can go check us out on YouTube. That's our 2023 goal. Um, so hopefully we'll be a little more active on that. I very much am very excited to see where the next like 12 months holds for us. Like we had a planning meeting and it seems very exciting and I'm very excited Mm -hmm. to bring this to our listeners. Um, and I hope you guys are excited as well for that. And if possible, if you like what you're listening, give us a review wherever you listen. Uh, we love to read them. Um, I myself have rated us five stars. I know that. <laughs> so mm-hmm. Me too. <laughs> um, <laughs> but on that note, um, this has been another episode of What the Forensics. Uh, we hope you enjoyed it. We hope you learned something. Um, we hope you have asked questions, thought of questions, and we will see you next time. Bye. Bye. Just a reminder to everyone that we are not professionals in the forensic science field. We are just interested in forensics and want to share what we are learning with our listeners. We're trying to give you the most accurate information, but we are human and can make mistakes. Thank you so much for listening, and we hope to see you next week. Mm